At the dawn of the 21st century, the single diesel unit still lags behind the most powerful steamer by some 25% in terms of horsepower output. But the iron horse was doomed for what it lacked in economy and for what it demanded in maintenance and support at the sheds. Everything had to be cleaned, fuel and water supplies replenished, small repairs carried out. A whole infrastructure vanished with the demise of the steam locomotive. Turntables, roundhouses, water columns, coaling stations and ash pits. Whatever remains is by chance rather than intent, like this haunted shed in Berlin. How different things appeared in the 1930s. The German 05003, in its original streamlined guise of 1937, now epitomizes the high mark of steam traction. Tender locomotives are at their best running forward. They were therefore turned on turntables for the return journey. The size of the turntable largely governed the size of the locomotives. This became a problem as soon as larger locomotives were inevitable, requiring a rebuilding of the turntables at several sheds. Tank engines were turned too, when possible, because the controls were laid out for running forwards. Locomotive sheds were often arranged around the turntable. Roundhouses, as they are called, saved a lot of switches. Any locomotive could be dispatched without being blocked by another. Even today, roundhouses and turntables may be used to advantage. But beware when something happens to the turntable, then a whole shed could be paralyzed. Steam locomotives devour water. Water columns in convenient places filled tenders with thousands of gallons in minutes. Large sheds had their own water supply, independent of the public water supply. Several railways in Britain, France and America had track pans installed so locomotives could take up water while running or on the fly. In the 1940s and 50s, New York Central locomotives took water at speeds up to 80 miles an hour. The quality of water certainly matters in prolonging boiler life. Chemicals are added to the water to prevent scaling. The blow-off valve is opened to remove mud and loose scale.
In small sheds, a conveyor belt loads coal, but it's hardly practical when 10 tons must be loaded and more locomotives await their turn. In Meiningen, they still have a coaling crane. Several locomotives could be served simultaneously by the chutes from coaling towers. The amounts were weighed and kept in records. Many railways provided a coal premium to promote economy with their personnel. A locomotive crew is at work long before a train leaves, but they share its fate. Whilst the fireman prepares his fire, the driver makes a thorough check around his machine. He gently taps parts with his hammer. By the sound, he can trace a loose nut or even a hairline crack, invisible to the naked eye. The conjugated gear of the four-cylinder drive is being oiled. Proper lubrication prevents trouble on the line. The compressor's lubricator is topped off. The oil is cranked to all points by hand before the compressor is started. When all is checked, the locomotive heads out to pick up its train. During coupling up, the locomotive presses its buffers against the train. The stoker is now able to tighten the coupler. A typical European scene. Elsewhere, automatic couplers are in common use. Hooking up the brake and train heating hoses is the same everywhere. A signal is given for the brake test. The train will not leave without the brakes being checked. Do the brakes hold? Will they release? Does the pressure in the train line recover? The driver receives his brake note and finally the signal for departure is given.
a smooth run with a nice hot engine. The sound from the exhaust muffles when the driver notches up. The train has gained enough speed and requires less effort from the locomotive. in a station. Now to bring a train to a halt at exactly the right spot is an art. Every train reacts differently. Not all runs are smooth. A slippery engine, for instance, requires a lot of attention. And so does a heavy train on an incline. More than 1,000 tons trail the tender. The slipping engine must be checked immediately. It becomes a real battle with a leaking cylinder cover.
This photo run ends quite differently than intended. Coal firing produces ash. The poorer the coal, the more ash and residue remains. Clinker is a result of non-combustible substances in coal. It clutters the grate, chokes the fire, and eventually impairs steaming. The remaining fire is shoveled from the grate in small locomotives. Large locomotives clean their ash pans and dump their fire above the ash pit. A drop grate slightly eases the arduous task of cleaning the fire. Another tough task is cleaning the smoke box in which cinders collect during running. Late in the steam era, an increasing number of locomotives were fitted with self-cleaning smoke boxes, meaning the cinders were spread in a haze across the landscape. Oil-fired locomotives were also of the self-cleaning variety. Their tubes were sandblasted once in a while to remove the crusted oil residue through the chimney. Steam locomotives have burned all kinds of fuels. Coal, lignite, oil, diesel oil, wood, anthracite, or even bagasse, the waste product of sugarcane. The issue of steam locomotive pollution was mainly a fuel problem. The fuels used were often cheap and of poor quality. The atmosphere in a station full of lignite burning engines was definitely unpleasant. But in theory, steam locomotives could have burned a fuel like LPG, a waste product most oil refineries in the world still flare off. 
In other words, the steam locomotive could have been as clean as a diesel. The smoke box door is firmly shut to ensure good steaming. It's all about that good draft, remember?